and he used Rana Ramchari. Um, he got his PhD from UCLA, working with uh, Matt Wright on the high end gamma ray background. Um, he was a postdoc in Santa Cruz, and he joined uh, Caltech as a staff scientist in 2001. And he's a member of the Goods team, and he's currently working on climate. Thanks, Hilke. It's uh, great to have a sunny day here because it's quite appropriate for the talk because I'm going to be talking about light after the first dark ages. Now, the first dark ages were actually historically used to represent this period of 500 years, which existed between 300 AD and 800 AD. And it was essentially a period of much cultural barrenness. There, were no, there was not much architecture. There was not much sculpture. There was certainly no news coming out of Europe during that, those period of 500 years. And it um, was to, the Dark Ages were used, the term was used to signify the end of the Roman Empire, which was last uh, commemorated by the building of the Palace of Diocletian in Split. And the end of the Dark, sorry, that was the start of the Dark Ages. The end of the Dark Ages was symbolized by the building of this cathedral in Aachen, Germany, by Charlemagne, who was basically, he was credited with the formation of the Franco German Empire, and then the subsequent cultural revolution that took place in Europe. So historically, Dark Ages were used to signify this period of 500 years. But astronomically, the period of the Dark Ages is a period right after the Big Bang. So here's a timeline where we're getting cut off here, but that's okay because we're insignificant. So the Big Bang happened up here, and the universe was really hot and ionized until this point. And then around a redshift of 1,000, the universe cooled to a temperature such that electrons could combine with the hydrogen atoms, and the universe became neutral. And so the universe became neutral at this point, was ionized back up here, and then it remained neutral as the universe cooled, 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 and then the first sources start to form. And that's around a redshift of 10, or about 500 million years after the Big Bang. We don't really know exactly when this happened, and that's what we're interested in finding. Now, as the first sources form, more and more of them start to form, and eventually, by about redshift of six, which corresponds to one billion years after the Big Bang, the universe became completely ionized. And this, because the universe became ionized again, after being ionized up here, is what we mean by reionization. And this period where we have the first sources form is what is symbolized by light at the end of the Dark Ages. So the big question, of course, is what are these sources that form? Why do they form in the way they do? Um, and what's the nature? Are they star forming? Are they supermassive black holes? What's the nature of these sources? Now, it's, very, it's an exciting time to be studying reionization because instrumentation capabilities have developed to an extent that we are actually able to detect galaxies well into the epoch of reionization. Some of you have seen the press releases that have been coming out at HSD and WIF3. Uh, we are detecting galaxies all the way out to redshift of 10. Which, which means that these are galaxies well after the end of the completions of reionization. So essentially what we're looking for is this Cathedral of Charlemagne, the astronomical version of the Cathedral of Charlemagne to understand the end of the Dark Ages and what is responsible for reionizing the universe. Why should we understand it? Well, it's arguably the second most important thing that happened uh, probably second in importance to where dark energy took over from dark matter, um, because it sets the temp what, whatever happens in the first billion years after the Big Bang sets the temperature and the metallicity of the interstellar medium, and that determines the nature of subsequent generations of stars. If the metallicity became very high, that means you have more normal stars forming very rapidly in the distant universe. If the metallicity remained low, you tend to have a more top-heavy IMF, so you have more massive stars. Uh, forming all the way down to lower regions. Another thing that happens is the size of the Stromgren spheres. So when you have an ionized, when you have a burst of star formation in a galaxy, it ionizes everything within some vicinity. Now, if that Stromgren sphere is very, very high, very, very large, what that means is it suppresses the formation of low mass galaxies and globular clusters in the vicinity of that galaxy. So whatever happens, uh, the process of reionization could define what happens in terms of formation of globular clusters and early dwarf galaxies. And correspondingly, it regulates the early growth of galaxies. 
if the interstellar medium is too hot, then you're going to suppress the formation of low mass galaxies and prefer preferentially high mass galaxies would form. If it was too cold, then you could have roughly equal uh, formation rates for low and high mass galaxies. And finally, it's the epoch in which you see the first generation of black holes. So we don't really know where quasars come from. We think they are, you know, thousand solar mass black holes accreting gas and growing at Eddington rates. But the epoch of realization uh, resulted in the seeding of the first generation of black holes. So it's important to understand what happened then to understand uh, where these quasars come from. But broadly speaking, what we're trying to understand is how these galaxies at redshift 10, as symbolized by this HST WIF3 image here, which came out about two weeks ago, which is about one kiloparsec across. So this image is about two and a half arc seconds across. This galaxy is undetected in the J-band due to the Lyman Alpha Forest, and it's detected in the H-band. We're trying to understand how this one kiloparsec little blob has ended up into these 10 kiloparsec zoo of galaxies that we see in the local universe. And basically, it's trying to understand how galaxies form and evolve. So in order to understand reionization, so why do we think that reionization, the end of reionization was around redshift 6? Well, the best piece of evidence for that comes from the Sloan quasars. What we have here is intensity as a function of observed wavelength. And this is the spectrum of a Sloan quasar. You can see clearly the Lyman alpha emission line. Um, and you can see a whole bunch of bumps and wiggles here. Now, any absorption that takes place between the Lyman limit, which corresponds to rest frame 912 angstroms, and Lyman alpha, which corresponds to rest frame 1215 angstroms, is due to neutral hydrogen in the vicinity of the quasar. So if there was even a small amount of neutral hydrogen present, it would absorb all these ionizing photons, and you wouldn't see anything come out. But at redshift 5.8, you can see that there is a small amount of flux coming out between the Lyman limit and Lyman alpha. That means that all the gas in the vicinity of this quasar has been completely ionized. Now, look at a quasar at redshift 6.28. In the immediate uh, uh, wavelength range, a short word of Lyman alpha, or just below, before the Lyman limit, you can see a sharp decrease in the amount of flux compared to the quasar at redshift 5.8. What this means is that there was still a small amount of neutral hydrogen. And that neutral hydrogen absorb the photons which are coming out of this wavelength range. So by measuring this thing, which is called the gun peterson trap, the presence or absence of flux at this wavelength range between the Lyman limit and the Lyman alpha, we get a constraint on how much neutral hydrogen there was early in the universe. And if you plot this neutral hydrogen fraction as a function of redshift from these quasars, not just these two, but several tens of them, what you find is the neutral hydrogen fraction is going up. It is this rise in neutral hydrogen fraction, notice that this is a log scale. This is unity. This is 10 to the minus 3. So we're looking, we're, this gun peterson trap is really sensitive to very small amounts of neutral hydrogen. So what we're finding is the amount of neutral hydrogen is going up, which means that that is probably the end of reionization. So the strongest evidence for the end of reionization being around range of 6, 6.5 is the increase in the neutral hydrogen carbon density inferred by the presence of this gun peterson trough in the spectrum of the Sloan quasars. That's one side of the story. Now, WMAP provides the other side of the story. What WMAP does is it measures temperature polarization cross correlation. So imagine a cloud of electrons, and the cloud of electrons scatters off the CMB photons and basically changes the brightness of the CMB photons. And it also imparts a polarization to the CMB. So by co correlating the temperature and the polarization, it tells you something about how many electrons were present. And what WMAP, by doing this correlation, what WMAP measures is this integral over redshift of the Thompson scattering cross-section times the electron density times the speed of light times dt dz. And WMAP measures this number tau which is measured to be basically 5 sigma of 0.084, plus or minus 0.016, so about 5 sigma. Now, just from this equation, you can tell that WMAP cannot tell if any is very high for a very short dt, or if any is very low for a very long dt. And that's essentially the big realization problem. We are trying to understand 
what any of z is as a function of time. But by virtue of the fact that it's only measuring tau, which is an integral over a redshift 0 to infinity of this quantity, we can discriminate between these two um, scenarios. So here is a plot which shows the same number. This is the W map range going from point 0.084 plus or minus 0.016. And you can see there are a bunch of squiggles and lines. These squiggles and lines are different reionization histories. So the reionization history shown by this blue line here, where this is the neutral hydrogen fraction as a function of redshift, can go up and down, up and down, up and down, and that's perfectly consistent with the WMAP measurement. Or it could be completely smooth and start to decline slowly until it completes by redshift six, consistent with the Sloan quasars, and that gives you a value which is also consistent with the WMAP value. So what we're trying to understand here is what is this neutral hydrogen fraction as a function of redshift? And can, can we infer this neutral hydrogen fraction as a function of redshift by using the WMAP tau? And the answer is no. So is that tau you know, current? That no. tau is WMAP uh, uh, WMAP 5, I think. But WMAP 7 is no different from that. Didn't it come down? It, actually, this is already down. So the first WMAP 1 was 0 0.12. And now it's 0.084. Now, so there's an interesting point here, which is of this 0.084, more than half comes between redshift 0 and 6. So WMAP is not even providing a 5 sigma constraint on reionization. It's giving a 2.5 sigma constraint on reionization. And that's a very important point, which, um, which I mean, which said WMAP solves reionization. Not really. It's giving a 2.5 sigma constraint on reionization, which is consistent with a broad range of models that I've shown here. So, but we have two pictures here. So we have one picture from the Sloan quasars saying reionization appears to be largely complete by redshift six or six and a half. And the other thing is from WMAP tau, we're unable to constrain if reionization is a slow extended process or it's a relatively brief process. So the physics of reionization, well, um, as many of you know, I mean, you have a hydrogen atom, it consists of a proton and an electron. If an, if an ionizing photon comes along, it knocks out the electron. So if you have one photon per hydrogen atom, basically the universe would be reanimated, right? Not really, because this electron likes to recombine. And because of these recombinations, you need a lot more than one photon per hydrogen atom. You need something of order three to 10 photons per hydrogen atom, depending on what the recombination rate is and what the clumpiness of the gas is. Now it's a physics one problem where if the gas is more clumped, the recombination rate is going to be higher because the density is higher. It just goes as any square. So the recombination rate goes as the electron density times the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen density times the recombination coefficient times the clumpiness of the gas. And this parameter implies that we need more than one hydrogen atom, more than one ionizing photon per hydrogen atom. We need something of order 3 to 10 photons per baryon to maintain the ionized hydrogen due to the combinations. Skip that. So can, can, the question is, can we get those three to 10 ionizing photons per hydrogen atom? And how do we go about measuring how many ionizing photons are produced? Well, we use this line and break technique. So the line and break technique uses the, um, uses the colors of galaxies in different fast bands, in this case, B band, which is the shortest wavelength, to the Z-band, to the longest, which is the longest wavelength. And you see there's no galaxy here. A galaxy starts to appear here, and it's really bright at these wavelengths. And what that is because of is because the Lyman, the Lyman alpha forest is suppressing everything shortward of this wavelength. So you can not see any flux in the V-band. And as you go to the V-band, you pick up a little bit of flux. And then you go to the I-band, the galaxy becomes even brighter. And then you go to the Z-band, and the galaxy is walking bright. So if you were to imagine that this galaxy were actually at higher redshift than 5.55, it wouldn't be seen even in the V band or the I band, and it would only be seen in the Z band. So this is how we detect distant galaxies. And this is, in fact, the dominant mechanism for detection of distant galaxies. But if we add up all the light coming from all the galaxies, we get something like this. This is a plot of actually the number of galaxies as a function of brightness, the blue lines show you the quasars, and the red lines show you the galaxies. 
The most striking thing about this plot is the quasars are much, much lower in number density than the galaxies. And so if you multiply this by the brightness of the galaxy, uh, of the quasar, you basically find that quasars are unable to produce the ionizing photons required to reionize the universe. In fact, it has to be star-forming galaxies because this is a log plot again, and this is something like two or three orders of magnitude difference in the number density of these sources. So basically, quasars are too few, which means supermassive black holes cannot reionize the universe, even extrapolating to the faint end of the quasar luminosity function. And so it has to be galaxies. It could be really low mass black holes, which is of order, you know, 100 to 1,000 solar masses, but we have really no constraint on that. Or it could be something exotic, like um, if you've seen astro, if you've been following astro pH closely, you'd see these uh, decaying dark matter stars, which probably only one group believes in. Um, so that's what, I mean, you have to keep an open mind. So it could be something as exotic as that. Sir, are you plotting the number of these objects, the number of large alpha photons produced by the In this plot, I'm plotting the number of objects. <coughs> but if I translate this to the number of ionizing photons, it basically looks very similar to this. So basically, quasars fall well below the number compared to star-forming galaxies. I, I can show you the plot later. So is that dominated you know, by the faint galaxies or, or, or the faint it, Yes. I'm trying to translate them. Yes, yeah, sorry. OK, this, this is faint on, uh, this is faint on this side. This is bright on this side. Yeah, right. I mean, like, and it's 2.5, I guess, is factor 10 something, right? Uh, I mean, I mean like 2.5 magnitude is, yeah. Right, so exactly. Slow, uh, so yeah, it's, it's the, the, the total brightness is uh, the total ionizing photon production rate is dominated by the faint galaxies. Oh, okay, so you actually know. I mean, like, the bright galaxies do not matter; they're much lower. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, but you only see the bright galaxies. Right? You only see the bright galaxies. I'm getting to that. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. But again, the quasars are a bit funny because even if they don't use ionizing photons directly, they have a hard spectra. They can heat. And then the heating can cause second, no, considerable second ionization, which you will not see in this body which you multiply. Yeah, so that's actually an excellent point. Um, so actually, it, it, it helps in two ways. So imagine a quasar sitting inside the Stromlin sphere. It's sitting inside the Stromlin sphere. So imagine a bunch of star forming galaxies which are in the vicinity of this quasar. Now, by virtue of the fact that the quasar has ionized everything inside the Stromlin sphere, the ionizing photons from the star-forming galaxies can actually escape much more easily. And now that would be a nice solution to everything. Um, unfortunately, there is no scenario. I mean, we have looked for ionizing photons escaping from star-forming galaxies in the vicinity of quasars at lower redshifts. And it hasn't worked out. Basically, the, the quasar tends to suppress star formation because the radiation from the quasar actually heats up the gas in these low mass halos in which the galaxies are forming, and their star formation rate tends to get suppressed, so the number of ionizing photons they produce also gets, goes down. So although you're right that um, I mean quasars can help either through secondary processes, as you said, or through this, through this bubble mechanism, um, the reality is, as far as we can tell, they don't help. So is that an observational result that they that actually is. see that? Uh, yes, so you can't do this at the epoch of reionization because the neutral hydrogen clouds uh, absorb all the ionizing photons. You can't do this at, say, redshifts 2 or 3, and so the measurements have been done at redshifts 2 and 3. Okay, so I was saying that basically quasars are too few in number, and the number of ionizing photons they produce are too low to do the reionization. So how much is this discrepancy? So ignore, ignore Ignore these terms fast and slow here for the time being. And what I'm plotting here is basically log of luminosity, which is equivalent to the number of ionizing photons required as a function of redshift. What we're measuring by adding up all the light from all the galaxies are these black squares. What we need is one of these lines up here. So you can see the discrepancy is a factor of at least 3, probably up to 10. And I won't go into the details right now about what these different lines are, but the, the point here is the bright galaxies that we are detecting also don't produce enough ionizing photons that are required to reanalyze the universe. 
So there's a problem. We don't have quasars producing enough ionizing photons. We don't have star forming galaxies producing enough ionizing photons. So what's going on? Well, if you were to translate this as a function of a luminosity function, so each of these points is a measurement from the latest HST with three UDF observations. And uh, the line is, of course, the best fit to these points. And this is the luminosity function of galaxies at redshift 4. So this is basically co-moving number density as a function of brightness, where this is bright and this is faint. What you see is between redshifts 4 and 7, the number of bright galaxies has declined. And as you go from redshift 7 to 10, you find an even more gradual decline in the number density of faint galaxies. And I'm saying that these star forming galaxies that you're detecting are not producing enough ionizing photons. So how much is that discrepancy? Well, this is how much the discrepancy is. So to maintain an ionized universe, you basically need the solid lines in this plot. And the best fit are these dashed lines, the best fit to the observations. So you can see that the discrepancy is about two sigma, uh, at, depending on what you get for the faint end slope of the galaxy luminosity function. So in terms of pure measurement, and there are a large number of theorists in this room, you would say this is just an observational error, which has probably got to do with the fact that we aren't completing for, uh, for incompleteness at the faint end property. But I mean, this is really the state of the art measurement, the best simulations and the best data. And it really seems to be the slope. And it's not as high as what the solid line should be. So, Another possible, so assuming that all the observations are correct, the other possibility is cosmic variance. What is cosmic variance? Well, cosmic variance means we are observing the really tiny patch of sky. This is an image of the dark matter distribution um, in a redshift, at redshift 6 in a delta z of point, oh, uh, 0.5. And this is a typical good field. And the data which have gone into calculating these luminosity functions at about one tenth the size of this Goods field. So imagine you slap it, you know, about ten of these fields all over this image. You're more likely to form in these relatively underdense regions than in this overdense region. So it is very likely that the observations might be sampling an underdense region of the universe, and it, the observational bias can be corrected simply by doing a wider field survey. The reality is telescope time is hard to get. And we don't have the instrumentation to cover, say, two square degrees to the depths that the Hubble Deep Field has been covered. So for simulations of realization, uh, where is it perceived from the high density field an hour or the lower density? Uh, for simulation, you, where does the... Yeah, where is the reality perceived? Does it always start from the high density region and high density reality yes. everything? It, it starts in the high density regions, right. but the low density regions kick in. Uh, I don't actually have a movie, but Steve Ferdinand does these simulations. Yeah. And he, so basically the Strombrin spheres around the high density regions are much, much larger. And the Strombrin spheres around the low density regions are smaller. But eventually they all merge together. Uh, so based on sheer number density, uh, in terms of co-moving volume, it would be the low mass scales which, uh, which contribute. Um, so, yes, so I was saying that one possible reason for this discrepancy could be that we're just not doing a proper survey, that we're not covering enough area to trace where the dark matter distribution is, and therefore we're not picking up uh, a good fraction of the sources which could be doing the reionization. But again, assuming that the observations are as good as we can do, how, what can we tweak to balance the ionizing photon budget? We can tweak the reionization history. And so this is two scenarios for the neutral hydrogen fraction as a function of redshift. One is a fast case, which is shown by this solid line, which is consistent with the WMAP tau and the Sloan measurement. And basically, the neutral hydrogen fraction drops from 90% to 10% within delta Z of 3. And that's what I'm going to call as fast reionization. The other scenario is this the first sources form maybe around redshift 15 or 20. And they start to form, 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 and then the nuclear hydrogen fraction drops much more gradually, and then it fall, drops steeply right at the end. This is the scenario of slow reionization, which takes place over, say, delta Z of 9. 
Both these are consistent with all the data that currently exists. Now, now we know that's the number of ionizing photons we need. So we can calculate um, what the luminosity function of galaxies should look like. Basically, we can calculate this quantity here. We can calculate these luminosity functions to, to take into account these two scenarios for reionization. And we can measure this UV slope. The UV slope is how many faint galaxies there are. So if the UV slope is steep, like up here between 2 and 2 and 0.5, that means there are a lot more faint galaxies. If the UV slope is shallow between 1 and 1.5, it means there are a lot fewer faint galaxies. So the keen eye would know that the dark matter halo mass function says that the number of low mass halos has a slope of about 2. Now for those two scenarios that I showed you, fast reionization versus slow reionization, okay, we can have two sub we basically have these four different lines. And only one of these lines stays below two. So why does it have to stay below two? Well, the reason it has to stay below two is if it exceeds two, that means that low mass halos produce stars much more efficiently. That's absolutely unphysical. Simply because the cooling times are too long, the star formation efficiency in these low mass halos is too low because the gas falls in, you have a star burst, and then it drives out all the gas from the halo. So the low mass halos don't produce stars at a very efficient rate for a long period of time. And so the low mass halos, which basically are dominated by these things which have the faint UV so cannot be steeper than the dark matter halo mass function. So there's only one line which stays below that, and that's the solid red line, which shows that slow reionization has to be the scenario if the observations are correct. All the other lines go over to, which means that the, the low mass halos are producing stars more efficiently, and that's simply unphysical. So what are you assuming about the escape fraction? Yeah. Mass. Yes, that was one of the nuisance parameters that I skipped over. So the escape fraction um, has, for this particular calculation, it was, it was 10%. Right, that's universal. It is 10% integrated over the entire luminosity function, yes. Um, now, you have certainly seen in the literature evidence that some galaxies have high escape fraction and some galaxies have low escape fraction. And this is certainly true. It means the faint end galaxies seem to have, let me show you that to our cam. The faint end galaxies. So this is a plot of escape fraction as a function of brightness. These are faint galaxies. And you can see that some people claim that faint galaxies are producing a lot more ionizing photons than the bright galaxies. Um, but again, when you look at the number of upper limits compared to the number of points. Okay? So when you integrate over the luminosity function, it tends to be on average of about 10%. Now it could be that our escape, our escape fraction knowledge is never going to be right. Okay? It, it basically purely comes out of simulations. This is an observation at redshift 3. So we have no idea what the escape fraction actually is at redshift 6. And then, it, there are, depending on how you model it, whether you have a rotation of the stars or you do not have a rotation of the stars, the, the ionizing photon production rate can differ about to 30%. So that's a fudge factor, to be honest. And I'm currently using the best estimate from the redshift 3 values integrated over the entire luminosity. So, um, so basically, this is the argument for slow reionization. The fast reionization ends up having too much energy coming out from low mass halos, which basically seems to be inconsistent with what we can simulate or what is physical. And the fact that slow reionization basically results in a luminosity function, which has a faint end slope that is less steep than the dark matter halo mass function, means that slow reionization where the first sources form around redshift 25 and the process extends over a delta z of at least 9 um, would be the solution. So let's summarize that. The observations show that detected galaxies cannot reionize the IGM. And so there must be a large number of faint undetected galaxies. And these faint undetected galaxies only work if reionization is a slow extended process exist uh, taking place over delta z of 9. 
if the action is at the faint end, so that begs the question, can our long duration gamma ray burst helpful? So why would gamma ray burst be helpful? Well, the gamma ray burst, especially the long duration ones, come from exploding massive stars. And all the observations that have been done of gamma ray burst host galaxies show that these galaxies are basically below, are under luminous. They're below L star, so they're 0.1 to 0.05 L star. And here's a example that I can show you. Here's a gamma ray burst which is detected in the J band and not in the R band. Therefore, it's at redshift of 6.3. And the gamma ray burst declines fairly rapidly on the time scale of days. And once it completely fades away, once this J band thing fades away, what we're left is, is this tiny little red smudge. And this tiny little red smudge is basically a faint sub L star dwarf galaxy. So the fact that gamma ray bursts are associated with sub L star galaxies seems to suggest that maybe gamma ray bursts are a good tracer for the star formation that's happening at the faint end of the galaxy luminosity function. And surprise, surprise, if you plot up gamma ray bursts rates as these points, compared to the star formation rate measured in field galaxy surveys, the GRB rates are high. Yes, the error bars are high too, but, well, the difference is larger than the error bars, and that's always one source of reassurance. So that says that GRB rates, especially average rate of six or eight, show a hint of a higher star formation, which means that this does seem to be more star formation at the faint end of the galaxy luminosity function. But I'm not claiming anything because the error bars are too high. This is just a suggestion based on, I mean, the G everything goes in that direction. We think faint galaxies should be producing more stars, and then you look at the GRB rates, the GRB rates are higher than expected, which means that maybe the faint galaxies are producing more stars. But that's only one piece of the, pro one, one, um, one clue to the answer. GRB suggests a larger ionizing flux from faint galaxies, but to be good astronomers, we should have at least two pieces of evidence. So the second piece of evidence comes from Spitzer. What Spitzer does is it measures the stellar mass density of galaxies. And from the stellar mass density, you can back calculate what the star formation rate is. So, kind of. I mean, so you have a human who's about 70 kilos. Uh, you could say you don't really know what, what the rate of growth of that human was. Did they start off at 10 kilos and grow at 1 kilo a year? Or did they um, end up being 70 kilos as a baby and then completely not produce any more mass? Um, but that's not really true for galaxies because get stars behave, well, reasonably, I would say. So we can do something like galactic archaeology, is what I call it, where you measure the brightness of a galaxy at different wavelengths, and you can tell whether it forms stars rapidly and died out, or whether it forms stars rapidly and then um, produce stars at a less rapid rate. And basically, the difference between these scenarios is imprinted on the specular energy distribution of the galaxy. So you can see that there's a black line here which corresponds to this black line, the blue line corresponds to this blue line, and this red line corresponds to yet another star formation history and that corresponds to yet another different, yet another different speculative energy distribution. So, from by measuring the speculative energy distribution of the galaxy, we can back calculate what its past might have been. And that's exactly what we do. So, in this paper by Ivo Labe, they used the HST detected galaxies and they measured the stellar masses of galaxies using Spitzer. If we didn't have these stellar, uh, these measurements from Spitzer you would have basically thought that the speculative energy distribution would fall off like this. So what the Spitzer measurements are telling you is that there is a lot more stellar mass in these galaxies than one might think simply from the optical data. So what does that mean? Well, you add up the light from all the galaxies. So what I showed you was three galaxies. Now you do this for all the galaxies that you can detect. And then you apply a completeness for the faint end for the galaxies that you can't detect. And what you find is, well, you basically find these two points. As a this is luminosity density as a function of wavelength. You find that the ultraviolet is up here, and you find the visible is down here. And the fact that you can do this for all the galaxies and add them up gives you a total stellar mass for galaxies at redshift 6. So now we can do what's that. You're missing like most of the galaxies. What's that? You're missing like, like the 
We are supposed to be miss, missing the bulk of the galaxies. Yes. Now, so there are uh, yeah. So there are a number of assumptions that that went in there. So we're missing the bulk of the galaxies, especially the faint ones that do matter. But the fact is, the faint galaxies tend to be bluer than the bright galaxies. What that means is they have a more homogeneous single mass to light ratio population, which means that their mass is much better defined than the galaxies at the bright end, which we can't detect. So bear with me there. So just assume that I can calculate what the stellar mass is for the faint galaxies that I can't detect. And I add them all together, and basically I get a stellar mass density. Now I can do the astronomical archaeology, <coughs> but I can back calculate how many stars were produced as a function of time, and therefore how many ionizing photons were produced as a function of time. So let's go back to our ionizing photons for baryon. Remember how many we need to, to for reionization? Not one, something greater than one, maybe three, maybe ten, but for our best estimate, it has to be the solid black line, okay, which is which basically starts at 2.8 and ends up at around 1. So for the stellar mass density that you're seeing in these early galaxies, for a normal IMF, which is a solid IMF, you basically can't get up to the black line. So these are different stellar mass functions, which all produce the same stellar mass density, which is consistent with these observations. And so the pink, the, this magenta line is for a low mass cutoff of five solar masses, the, the purple line is for a low mass cutoff of two solar masses, and so on, so 5, 2, all the way down to 0.1. So if you just take the normal IMF, and you fit the stellar mass density, you still don't get enough ionizing photons. There's a shortfall of about a factor of 1.4. What this means is you have to change the slope of the IMF to get up to the number of minimum number of ionizing photons. Why do you have to change the slope of the IMF? Basically, massive stars produce more ionizing photons per unit baryon that is in the star compared to low mass stars. Just by virtue of the fact, so if you produce, say, a 10 solar mass star as opposed to 10 1 solar mass stars, you get a lot more ionizing photons. So by changing the slope of the IMF in these galaxies at redshifts greater than 6, you basically get a lot more ionizing photons per baryon out. And that helps solve the reionization problem, which cannot be solved by simply cutting off the mass function. So just to summarize that point, assuming that we know what the stellar mass of all the galaxies is, and we add it all together, including the faint ones, for a normal IMF, you don't get enough ionizing photons per baryon. You fall about a factor of 1.4 below what is required. Again, for normal escape fractions, normal dumping factors. And so the present day universe says that this should be the stellar mass function in galaxies. The less than one billion year old universe is this, is this dashed line. So there are about a factor of three to five more massive stars than you would get for a normal IMF. So basically, the people are, the stars were more obese earlier in the universe than they are in the present day universe. So let's summarize that point. Basically, the evidence from the stellar mass says that you need a lot more ionizing photons to, um, to account for reionization. And the only way, and there isn't a lot more stellar mass. So we have to get a lot more ionizing photons, and you do that by having more massive stars. So by having a top MV IMF with a dn dm of stars going as m to the minus 1.6, you get more ionizing photons, and therefore you get, um, um, well, therefore you're able to reionize the universe. Now, of course, massive stars, no surprise, they go off as supernovae or as gamma ray bursts. And, the, and we already saw before that the gamma ray burst rate is higher than what is expected for the typical star formation rate. That was assuming a solid IMF. You put in a more top heavy IMF, every, the gamma ray burst agrees perfectly with the star formation rate density. So that's the two pieces of evidence we were looking for GRBs and stellar mass densities with a top heavy IMF basically solve reionization and solve the discrepancy between the GRB rates and the star formation rate density. Of course, we'd like to have some good physical motivation for this. So the physical motivation is when you go up to redshift 6 or higher, 
the intercellular medium temperature is higher by basically one plus z because the CMB is heating the ISM. The density is low because, well, the gas is ionized, and the genes mass goes as heated to three, three halves the density to the minus one half. So if the temperature is high and the density is low, the genes mass is higher, and that preferentially results in the formation of more massive stars. And of course, as for humans, if you are more active, which means you have more star formation, and you have a healthy diet, which means you get more minerals and metals into the ISM, you get rid of the top heavy IMF. You get back to a normal IMF that you mm -hmm. see in the local universe. So for the, the type of galaxies, um, uh, is there any measurement that those type of galaxies have top heavy IMF? You cannot, there is no observation that we can do to constrain the IMF in galaxies, in individual galaxies. Right. Especially the ones out at redshift six. I mean, you can barely do this at redshift zero, let alone at redshift six. Um, so the answer to your question is no. And but I, I don't know if you were to say, right, but what know. observation would you do to say that? Okay, there is actually one piece of evidence. Let me correct myself here, and that's very very tentative. Which is, if you look at the ultraviolet slope <coughs> of galaxies um, at redshift six and higher, they are too blue. They're bluer than one would expect for a normal IMF. That is a very, very tentative clue right. that it's because of more massive stars, which massive stars would have a harder radiation field. So, okay, so that was basically the question. Yeah. I mean, this is. is that, that <coughs> blueness, that blueness, I mean, do you need, like, because that, that, the IMF should pull it fairly top there. Yes. Uh, I mean, like, is that blueness? fit in with that level of top heaviness? Okay, so no. So we can't we can't do that. I can't tell you from the blueness. Yeah. I can only tell you from the blueness whether or not it's saltpeter. Okay. Because there's a big uncertainty to convert from IMF to UV slope, including right. nebular emission, which is actually a big uncertainty. Um, so I can't tell you is that blueness consistent with the M to the minus 1.6? I can tell you that it's consistent with with not being salt beater. Right. Yeah. Can, can you go through the steps again in the argument that the gamma reverse rate implies a top and a mass function? So you measure a gamma reverse rate. Yeah. You measure a star formation rate. Yeah. And you know that only a small fraction of stars locally must mass stars more massive than tensile mass. I would assume the same inequality still has to hold that's a high redshift as well. That's so right. there's some additional mass cut that's being made. That's right. So to, to convert star formation rates, to, uh, note that I've plotted star formation rate here. So I basically converted the GRB rate to a star formation rate, taking into account the efficiency or GRB production for unit star formation. So if you have 10 solar universe. Well, it's calibrated out to redshift 2, between redshift yeah. 0 and 2. So the calibration factor was applied between redshift 0 and 2, and then the same calibration factor was applied out to higher redshift. Now, if you want to be a real critic, you could say, well, maybe the calibration factor is changing. And that would be fine. I mean, that it, so you're really talking about this last data point on the right? The I'm, I'm talking about all the points beyond redshift 4, where uh, basically beyond redshift 3, uh, where everything is everything becomes given, given the errors are really meant to take seriously the this is why I said one piece of evidence from GRBs is not sufficient because the error bars are too large. But now we have two pieces of evidence, one from the stellar mass density and one from the GRBs. And they're both completely independent of each other. And they both give you the same answer. Um, the redshift 8 GRB rate is based on a very small number of events. It's based on one. So yes. I have not been shy about converting one event to a co-moving number density. Um, I do admit that, and the Poisson error bar does reflect that. Um, but, I mean, the total number of GRBs in this is about 65. Okay? And of course, the vast majority of them are at redshift below 3. Um, so there are about 5 points in the redshift 6 point, and uh, 10 is in the redshift 4 point. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. So that criticism is perfectly valid. But again, one piece of evidence by itself wouldn't have solved it, but we have two pieces of evidence. 
Okay, now can we have a third piece of evidence? And that is faint galaxies. So I said all the activity is coming from faint galaxies. These might be GRB holes, they have top heavy IMAPs. And galaxies which are below the detection limit do contribute some flux to the, in, in an image. They basically contribute the integral of the number counts produces this faint glow that you see. I'm grossly exaggerating this, but this faint glow that you see here is due to unresolved sources below the detection limit. The little blobs that you see here are the real detected sources. Now, by looking at the fluctuations in the infrared background, can we infer the presence of a very large number of faint galaxies? And there are models for this. So if these population three stars were responsible for reionizing the universe, the models say that the angular power spectrum as a function of angular scale should have should look something like this. Okay, it should be somewhere between these two lines. And when people went and took a Spitzer image, masked out all the detected galaxies as shown by the black holes, and then measured the power spectrum of what is left behind, what they found was surprise, surprise they found something which started turning up. So people got very excited, said, OK, this must be the signatures for population three stars in the power spectrum of the infrared background fluctuations. Now, just think about this. You have a, you have a flux limited survey. And so you know that there are going to be some galaxies below your detection limit. And so where would you expect all the galaxies just below the detection limit to be? Would you expect them to be at low redshift, high redshift? Any opinions? Well, there's a lot more volume between redshift 0 and 6 than there is between redshift 6 and 10. So if you were to look, if you were to take a flux limit survey, you basically expect a very large number of galaxies to be predominantly at lower redshifts. And the point is, faint dwarf galaxies Whose part, who, which are detected in other wavelengths, do contribute to this slight upturn that we see. So let, we, now we took this image, and then we went and looked at a really deep optical data image of the same field. And then we masked out those really faint optically detected dwarf galaxies. Now what we found is the power spectrum went from the red dots down to the orange dots. And that's bad, because if it's coming from population three stars, this should remain constant regardless of whether we're masking out sources or not. And then we go and measure what the redshift distribution of these sources should be. And we basically, this was a prediction based on a uh, few detections. And we found that the average spectrum of this galaxy should be consistent with redshift 2 at about 10 to the 8 solar masses. Now, 10 to the 8 solar masses is very, very sub L star, well below the individual detection limits of galaxies. And sure enough, now we have the new Hubble Ultra Deep Field data, and we detect 100% of these dwarf galaxies that we had previously inferred. There's a 100% detection rate of these predicted dwarfs, and the observed demand tube distribution is perfectly consistent with what we predicted. I mean, I, I, if I wanted, I couldn't have made this better. But what that, well, maybe one, what that does say is stacking, which is what we used to infer the prediction of the infer the existence of these sources, that's work. And uh, basically, there are 26 and a half, 27 magnitude sources, which are about 10 to the 8 solar mass galaxies. <laughs> and so then we can go back. Now that we've actually detected these sources, we can measure the photometric redshifts of these galaxies. And the median is about redshift 2, but they show a steep decline with high redshift, with increasing redshift. So faint dwarf galaxies, which are basically between redshift 0 and 2, are contributing power to the infrared background fluctuations. So not all the detected fluctuations that we are detecting, sorry, not all the detected fluctuations that we are measuring is coming from pop three stars. But it's very tentative. That's brought it down from there to here. Can this be responsible for population three stars? I think jury is out on that. And what we can do is we can test this in another way, which is we can measure the total line of sight brightness. So we can measure the total brightness from all these galaxies that are responsible for the fluctuations. And for the fast reionization scenario, they produce one in these 
CID units, and in the slow reionization scenario, they produce about 0.6. Now, those of you who are familiar with this field know that the total background at these wavelengths is about 20. So we're looking for, well, sorry, the, the total background at this wavelength is about 20. So we're, we're looking for 0.2 over 20, which is basically a one part in 100 measurement. Impossible to do from Earth orbit, impossible to, to do from the inner solar system, because the zodiacal light kills you. The zodiacal light, as shown by this uh, pie chart here, contributes something of order uh, 74, 75% of the total line of sight brightness. And the zodiacal light is extremely uncertain and time dating. So there is no way we can calculate, we can measure this signal to one part in 100 when the zodiacal light is this dominant. And so that should make something go off in your head and say, let's go outside the zodiacal light. Okay? Sure, but it's really expensive. So the grand view, the grand plan is when one of these missions goes to the outer solar system, say Jupiter or Saturn, we'll piggyback a little instrument on it, and that goes outside the zodiacal cloud that you can see over here, and then we are no longer um, affected by the fluctuations in the zodiacal light or the total brightness in the zodiacal light. Now, of course, this is really expensive, as those of you know, and getting anything into Earth orbit is a billion dollars, and, but that's why we have to piggyback something on an outer planet mission, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that in this decade. But, but what if you look towards lasers? Can't you see these annihilation simulators? I mean, like, I don't even know the difference where they, uh, you have some background, but I have hold on this they sort of interact with high energy and stuff. Yes, sure. So your, your point is um, the TV photons that are coming from lasers pair produce of the infrared background photons, and uh, so that places an upper limit on the intensity of the extragalactic uh, background light. Um, that's true, but that's only sensitive to values like 10, not 0.1. So, um, and there is a very large uncertainty got to do with the intrinsic spectrum, intrinsic TV spectrum of the blazars. And yeah, so those two effects kill you, and there's no way you can get one in 100 position with that. So let's summarize. We are detecting galaxies well into the reionization effort, as I showed you. There are all these faint smudges, typically on scales of one kilo, typically with sizes of about one kiloparsec. And even when we add up all the light from individual galaxies, they don't produce enough ionizing photons to reionize the universe. Because the detected galaxies don't. Which means that faint galaxies are responsible for the action. Now, GRB hosts are faint galaxies. And the GRB rates also seem to be high compared to so the star formation rate for a typical uh, saltpeter IMF. So the, GRB, the fact that the GRB rates are high does indeed indicate that faint galaxies might be active and be responsible for much of the star formation. However, to produce the number of ionizing photons required um, and not be steeper than the dark matter halo mass function, you can't have too many faint galaxies which means that that constrains reionization. And it basically implies that reionization needs to be slow and extended over at least a delta C of 9, which means that the light that our cathedral at Aachen is basically a first star which probably formed around redshift 25, if not higher redshift. The sources that are responsible for reionization could in principle be seen in the infrared background fluctuations. And the fluctuations have been detected. They've been detected in Spitzer data. You'll probably see a paper soon saying they were detected in Akari data. But the fact is, faint foreground dwarf galaxies appear to be dominating the fluctuation signal. So we haven't quite seen the signal from the reionization epoch uh, galaxies in the infrared background. Although in principle, that would be possible. And finally, uh, it seems that the cleanest way to do this is by doing an absolute measure of the extragalactic background light. Unfortunately, the zodiacal light is the dominant uncertainty there, so we need to get outside the zodiacal light. And the way we're going to do this is try to piggyback a little instrument which goes um, on a mission to the outer planets. Of course, it takes like eight to 10 years to get to the outer planets, so we have plenty of time to do the observations. And once we're outside the zodiacal cloud, 
uh, we can measure the EPL with greater precision than has currently been possible, and this could very well confirm the slow reionization hypothesis. So thank you.